You are about to listen to a free portion of The Young Turks. To podcast the complete show, sign up for membership at tytnetwork.com slash membership. All right, back on The Young Turks. Uh, a lot more stories for you guys, so let's get going. So recently, there was something interesting that happened. Uh, the New York Times wrote a positive story about Bernie Sanders. Wow, okay, that's good. That rarely happens in the establishment press. So obviously, it had to be corrected. Now, wait till you get a load of this unbelievable bias, and a bias that they have now admitted. So the positive article uh, had the headline, Bernie Sanders scored victories for years via legislative side doors. So now if you read the article, it says, okay, now here's how he worked with some people, including John McCain and other Republicans, to actually get things done. Even though he is the most liberal senator, he was actually fairly effective in getting all these different pieces of legislation done. Now that's accurate, that's true, those are facts. And they had quotes from John McCain and others. Um, and, and also, of course, progressives lauding him. Well, that cannot stand. You can't have a pro Bernie article in the establishment press. They hate him. Now, don't just trust me on that. I've been telling you that, and I've proved it over and over again with headlines from all these different places, right? And coverage on cable news. Now, I get a load of what they did to uh, Bernie Sanders in the paper of record, okay? They changed the title from a positive one to this one. Via legislative side doors, Bernie Sanders won modest victories. Now, two things happen here. I know it's subtle. First, they put the side doors first, like through the side doors. He got modest victories. So they're not interesting and important in victories anymore. Now they're just modest victories, and he got them through the side door. Now, the side door was in the first title, too, but it wasn't a point of emphasis. Now you say, okay, hey, Cenk, wait, 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 wait. Now that's not that big a deal. Let's dive into the story and see, we'll see what else they have. They had positive quote from John McCain about how Bernie Sanders, the guy who they say can't get anything done with the Republicans, actually got something done with the Republicans. Take it out. Gone. Not interested in that. Okay, there was a quote from uh, Warren Gunnels, who's a policy advisor for Bernie Sanders, who, who actually worked with him to get things done when uh, he's in Congress. And he said, we were, quote, very successful, right? Well, and also the very fact that they got the legislation passed shows they were indeed very successful. That's removed. That's gone. We can't have those positive things in the article anymore. Okay. And instead, language like this gets edited: with few sweeping legislative achievements in a quarter century in Congress. So after they say, yeah, 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 he got these things done, but it was a few uh, achievements in a quarter century in Congress. And don't give the guy any credit. What were we thinking? By the way, you know what they did? They had the positive article up for uh, Monday morning. A bunch of supporters of Bernie Sanders go, oh, wow, amazing. We finally got a positive article. New York Times and the establishment press. They send around, including Bernie Sanders himself, puts it out on social media. And then they're like, psych, now we're changing it. Was there an editor's note saying it's been changed? Nope. So now it seems like Bernie Sanders is sending around a negative article about himself. If you read it, it never says that it was changed. Okay, what else did they put in there? Uh, language like this. Uh, tacking on amendments to larger bills to succeed at the margins. <laughs> we're so sorry. We were actually fair and honest about him for one brief moment. For a couple of hours on a Monday morning. No, no, we can't have that. Now all of his victories have to be diminished, like we did in all the elections. Oh, he won Vermont, but that's his home state. He won New Hampshire, but that's close to his home state. He won Kansas and uh, and uh, Colorado and Minnesota. Uh, they're too white. Kansas is weird. That's a weird caucus. Everywhere he wears his, wins is weird or white or too pro-Bernie. Are there articles about how the states Hillary Clinton wins are too pro-Hillary Clinton? No. Are there articles about all of our legislative achievements uh, being not important, de minimis, etc.? By the way, you could write that article, but they haven't written it yet. But when it comes to Bernie Sanders, oh my God, what are you, hey, Jennifer, what did you write this article for? Are you crazy? Saying, Bernie, give me that article. Some editor, for some reason, which we'll talk about in a second, we'll have to figure out why, decided, no, I'm going to knock this guy down a peg. But I haven't gotten to the worst part. They inserted these two paragraphs. By the way, nothing they have asserted so far is a fact. It's not like, hey, what, what, Jennifer, you wrote this article, but we can't have it because you forgot to mention this fact and this percentage and this piece of legislation. No, only snarky opinion is added into this New York Times uh, factual piece. Okay? Then they added these two paragraphs out of nowhere. Quote, 
But in his presidential campaign, Mr. Sanders is trying to scale up those kinds of proposals as a national agenda. And there's little to draw from his small ball legislative approach to suggest that he could succeed. Mr. Sanders is suddenly promising not just a few stars here and there, but the moon and a good part of the sun. From free college tuition paid for with giant tax hikes and a huge increase in government health care, which has made even liberal Democrats skeptical. Not a fact in there. Instead, snark. Like, <laughs> Even Democrats, liberal Democrats, yeah, he's running against a Democrat. Yes, all the Democratic politicians uh, have endorsed her. Wow, some Democrats are also skeptical of him. Right. Uh, do you have any quotes? Do you have any facts? No, nothing. Oh, they're promising the moon and the stars <laughs> with this legislative record. They hate him. They can't stand him. I don't mean they hate him as in they dislike him personally. I mean, that there's something about Bernie Sanders where these editors, not just at the New York Times, but as we showed you in the Washington Post and as we've shown you in many other places, look at and go, ugh, not that guy. Derisive, dismissive, obnoxious, condescending. Because why? Bernie Sanders might change things. New York Times is the paper of record. You think they want things changed? They like their position at the top. They don't want any other paper coming in there. They don't want any change. And they don't even know it. If you told them that, they'd be like, that's outrageous. Even though I just freaking proved it to you. I just showed it to you, right? And I'm not the only one. You know who else agrees? The New York Times public editor herself. She came out and lambasted them. She says, the changes, this is Margaret Sullivan, public editor for the New York Times. The changes to the story were so substantive that a reader who saw the piece when it first went up might come away with a very different sense of Mr. Sanders' legislative accomplishments than the one who saw it hours later. Now, <laughs> why? Why do they do it? Now, in this case, the worst case scenario is there's a Hillary Clinton supporter who called up a friend. They've all known each other for decades. That's what I'm talking about. They don't realize what they're doing is malicious some of the time. By the way, this is the best. This is the worst case scenario because this would be involve actual corruption, though. A Hillary Clinton supporter, or staff member, etc., calls an editor at the New York Times, says, "Hey, turn that positive piece into a hit job for me." And he goes, "Okay, great, no problem, I can do." The best case scenario is they just do it for her because they've all lived together and worked together for decades. None of them want real progressive change. They like the system as it is. They won in this system. So they're like, no, 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 no. It's, it's in their instincts. They viscerally can't stand Bernie Sanders. They can't stand the idea of change. And they have to support the establishment candidate. Now, now, his accomplishments mean nothing. No, no, no. We're going to write this so he looks bad and not good, okay? Why? why? If you ask him why, oh, well, come on, it's not realistic. Bernie Sanders is not going to win. He's not electable. But your own polls show he's more electable than Hillary Clinton. No, I don't listen to the polls. I don't listen to facts. I can't stand the guy. That's what this establishment press is. I'm sure they'd be shocked and chagrined to know that people think that. Then why? Why'd you do it? Who was the editor who did it? Come on, New York Times. Now look, there again, Margaret Sullivan fessing up to more. She says, Sullivan said she asked the editors about the change, and they claimed that they wanted to add nuance and depth. <laughs> Where's the depth? Where are the facts? No, you wanted to smear him. She says, fair enough, but in this case, I don't agree. Okay, any reasonable person reading those two different articles would not agree. So who's the editor? Is there going to be any consequences? Are they going to be suspended, fired? And more important than that, I just want to ask him, why don't you come on the show, right? You'll never do it, right? Oh, online media, well, the one that has so many more views than us online. Oh, the people like them. <laughs> no, 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 I do declare. We're the establishment. We'll never go on there. Okay, then go on anywhere you like and answer the goddamn question. Why did you doctor that story? Why did you do it? I'm curious. Are you a Hillary supporter? Are you paid by Hillary supporters? Or do you just think, I no, I I don't like Bernie Sanders, and I had to put a hatchet in his back. What is it? You explain it. Because right now, that looks awful. So that's what the New York Times has turned into. So when we say the establishment media is against Bernie Sanders, we, unlike them, have facts to prove it. So here's an excellent case of it. And there are many others, and we've shown you. 
Here's what the people in power don't want, change. Okay. Now, I'm uh, on the other hand, uh, whereas cable news, uh, we'll go to the next story. Uh, whereas cable news is nothing but uh, pulp, and of no use whatsoever. From time to time, uh, the print journalists do a great job. And in this case, it's the Washington Post. Now, I've talked about the, how the Washington Post has uh, gone after Bernie Sanders before. Their editorial side despises him. The worst editorials anywhere. I, maybe even worse than the Wall Street Journal. So they've all in unison decided Bernie Sanders is not the guy. Okay, But we do have a case here where they've done some uh, great journalism, which is what the Washington Post used to be known for. Here's what they did. The Washington Post decided, hey, it seems like the Clintons have raised a lot of money throughout their lives. So maybe we should look into this. Great, thank you for doing that. So they found out that in the 41 years that they've been involved in politics, the Clintons have raised $3 billion. Okay, probably uh, don't think they owe anybody for that. No. Okay, now let's be fair. The majority of the money, $2 billion, has gone to the Clinton Foundation. So now it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, I love that uh, they're doing charity with that. Uh, bless their hearts. Could have done a lot worse with the money, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, governments like Saudi Arabia give a lot of money uh, to the Clinton Foundation. Many governments do, uh, with uh, dictators who are running those governments. You think they're doing it out of goodness of their heart? Saudi Arabia really cares about human rights? Or could they possibly want favors from Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State at the time, or Hillary Clinton, who might become the next President of the United States? Okay, but I, I, I love that it's at least the majority of it is going to charity. Now let's talk about the rest. Separately, donors have given $1 billion to support Clinton's political races and legal defense fund, making capped contributions to their campaigns and writing six-figure checks to the Democratic National Committee and allied super PACs. What do you guys think? A uh, billion dollars in donations to your political efforts? Might that sway a person? No, we're told that the Clintons are superhuman. Uh, that they take all this money from people and think, I don't care what you want. Now, you might have said that once, but then they wouldn't have given the money to you again. But they've been giving it to you for four decades. You know what that means? They got a good return on investment. So let's dive in a little bit more. Now, it's not just political money that they're getting or the charity money. In some cases, companies connected to their donors hired the Clintons as paid speakers helping them collect more than $150 million on the lecture circuit in the past 15 years. Now, unlike uh, the other two cases, this is money that they take and go, oh, thank you very much. Here, I take it and I put it in my pocket. <laughs> now I'm $150 million richer. Now, when somebody gives you $150 million, you think they're doing it because you gave a 40-minute speech? They say, wow, what a great speech, pearls of wisdom. Or perhaps they might want something in return. No, we're led to believe by the establishment, absolutely not. Why, I never. Really, somebody gives $150 million and wants something in return? Well, how dare you question their honor? <laughs> yeah, I question it. Believe me, I question it. So, now let's give you a small example of it. Mark Benioff, chief executive of the cloud company, computing company, Salesforce.com, gave $50,000 with his wife, Lynn, to the Ready for Hillary Super PAC in 2013. The next year, Salesforce.com paid Hillary Clinton $451,000 to deliver two speeches. Wow. <laughs> Again, those speeches must be unbelievable. Come on, anybody think they're really giving it for two hours of her time? Now, look, I, I don't know Mark Benioff. Maybe he's a great guy, he's given to Democrats. Uh, more likely to be progressive than a, a Republican donor. Uh, and I understand that they don't want unilateral disarmament in a time where the Republicans raise a tremendous amount of money. But that is not going to a political campaign. That's going into Hillary Clinton's pocket. So I think at a bare minimum, it's fair to ask, if someone gives you $450,000 for doing almost nothing, is it remotely possible they might want something in return? Okay, now... Um, why did they decide to go in this direction in the first place? Well, it goes back to the roots of Bill Clinton in Arkansas. 
So here's what the Washington Post reports. After Bill Clinton's unsuccessful labor-backed race for Congress, the couple hewed toward moneyed interests courting banks and corporate leaders in Arkansas. So that reminds me of the lesson that George W. Bush uh, learned in Texas. He lost his first race because somebody came in and was a holy roller and out god him. And he made up his mind at that time, as a politician, nobody's going to out god me from now on. So from then on, he ran all his races in Texas and then eventually nationally as God this and my father above and this and that and the Bible and etc. Who is your favorite philosopher? Jesus. Now, for the Clintons, they went in a slightly different direction. Oh, union, that didn't work. They weren't strong enough. Who's their opponents? Oh, corporate America. Great. I'll go with you guys. And from then on, all they had was win after win after win. Now, you think maybe they owe those guys? No. You think that maybe those guys kept giving to them for all those decades because they got paid back? No. Bankers wouldn't care about investments. They just love to give money away. Okay. And Hillary Clinton, uh, as part of this strategy, went and sat on the board of Walmart for five years. Now, Sam Walton then came out uh, when the Clintons decided they were going to run for president and said, I assure you the Walton family will join many others across the nation to provide Bill maximum financial assistance as well as other campaign support. Now, the Waltons until then had only given the Republicans. But Bill Clinton comes along and Hillary Clinton, they sit on the board, they go, hey, don't worry, trust us, we're on your side. And after proving in Arkansas that they were on the Walton side and Walmart's side, of course, Sam Walton, the founder of uh, Walmart, uh, Sam Walton goes, okay, I like this investment. I like the low cost (laughs) of uh, what I'm getting here. Uh, I'm buying. Okay. So now what is the result uh, after all these years? Um, they, the Clintons, made historic inroads on Wall Street, pulling in at least $69 million in political contributions from the employees and packs of banks, insurance companies, and securities and investment firms. Now, I wanted to share that with you because um, you've got all the, the billion dollars that they raised uh, overall, but specifically, just from the financial industry, $69 million. Now, a lot of that it, uh, didn't just go to Bill Clinton. It also went to Hillary Clinton. Uh, she got over $30 million of it. So they're both taking, taking, taking. Now, a uh, spokesperson for Hillary Clinton uh, responded, saying, however, it should be noted that it would be misleading at best to conflate donations to philanthropy with political giving. Okay, we didn't. We told you that two out of the three billion is... Uh, going to the charity, although, again, some governments giving to that for reasons hard to discern um, when they otherwise couldn't care less about human rights. Um, now, he continues, and regarding the campaign contributions, the breadth and depth of their support is a testament to the fact they have both dedicated their lives to public service in fighting this to make this country stronger. Yeah, 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 the banks gave them $69 million dollars because they care so much about how the Clintons have given their lives to public service. <laughs> they say this stuff with a straight face. And everybody in D.C., if they watch this, they'll be mad. They'll be like, oh, how, what are you, why are you laughing? No, of course. They took the $150 million, put it in their pocket. They took a billion dollars in corporate donations, and union donations too, by the way, but they're much, much, much smaller. And they use it for their politics. They took $69 million from the banks, used it for politics, but they never paid him back. No, no, no. In fact, they fight against those guys. And even though they're fighting against the banks to make sure they serve the public interest, the banks keep giving them money anyway. Yeah, I know. The banks and corporations, such suckers. They're like, oh, yeah, 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 here's money so you could fight against me. That happens a lot. <laughs> think about how naive they, uh, they think we are. That they're going to treat us that way. And a lot of them have internalized it in Washington. Like, oh, yeah, we got to. Yeah, no, 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 no. The money doesn't affect me. What where, where do you need me to sign? Oh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, how about the bankruptcy bill? Well, before she personally had to run, uh, she did a good job. She talked to Elizabeth Warren way back in the day, uh, back in the late 1990s. 
and made sure that Bill Clinton didn't sign the bankruptcy bill, which the banks wanted. Good, oh, well, that proves that they're uh, honest, and sometimes they hold the banks account. Now, what he did sign was two other bills that massively deregulated the banks, got rid of Glass-Steagall, allowed them to gamble with our money, had that wind up. Well, it led to a gigantic crash in 2008. But meanwhile, she said, hey, 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 we didn't vote for the bankruptcy bill. Until, of course, she took even more money from the banks while she was running for New York Senate seat. And then after she got that Senate seat, guess what she did? She voted for that bankruptcy bill that the banks wanted all along. No, she wouldn't do them any favors for all those millions of dollars. This is why there's a political revolution afoot in this country. Because you people in Washington and New York, you think we can't see it. You think we're stupid. We can see it. We can see it a hell of a lot clearer than you can. People don't get billions of dollars and, ex- and do nothing in return. They certainly don't do it for four decades. Somebody doesn't give you a couple of million bucks and then have you work against them and they give you another couple of million bucks. That's not how the world works. They give you a couple of million, you prove that they they control you and you'll do exactly as they tell you to do, and then they give you another couple of million and on and on it goes for four decades. That's how it works. Okay, now I want to give you a couple of examples to end here. So um, they talk about some of the donors specifically in the Washington Post piece. Among them are Elaine and Gerald Schuster. Uh, who made his fortune operating nursing homes and public housing developments, tangling with union leaders, government regulators, and housing activists in the process. So, huh, looks like they're against unions and workers. But the Clintons took their money, that's for sure. Together, the Boston-based couple have given 53 separate donations to support the Clintons since 1992, including $276,100 to their races, and more than $500,000 to their donations. Now, you help us beat the unions back. You help us beat regulations back. I'll give some to your political campaign. I'll give some to your foundation. Why am I giving to your foundation? Oh, I really care about charity. Yeah, no, 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 definitely. But meanwhile, help me out with the unions, okay? Now, we go to a, a, a donor Well, in some ways, she seems more gullible than the other guys. A lot of the bankers, very clear deal here. I give you money, you give me bigger money, right, through your legislation. This one's a little different. She remembers, as she says about Hillary Clinton, uh, she remembers everything we ever talked about, said Susie Tompkins Buell, a close friend and co-founder of Esprit, Esprit, who with her husband Mark has given $420,000 to the Clinton's campaigns and $11.25 million to their foundation. She says, Hillary does not like to ask for money. Oh, no, no, she doesn't. It's not natural for her, but she's got really good people who work for her, who speak for her, and she's very, very appreciative when she knows someone has done something for her, and you know it's sincere. (laughs) See, they've got themselves believing this stuff. Like, no, Hillary Clinton cares about me. And they talk about how she writes handwritten notes to all these donors. Did Hillary Clinton write you a handwritten note? All right, you didn't give her a couple of million bucks. (laughs) When somebody gives her a couple of millions, oh, this is so heartfelt. Oh, my God. Hey, uh, assistant, assistant, let's go. Whose birthdays is it? Who's in the hospital? Let's go. Oh, let me tell you this. Oh, I got $11 million. How wonderfully sincere. And... uh, but I did like that she accidentally said she's very, very appreciative when she knows someone has done something for her. Finally, we go to Steve Wesley, who's a venture capitalist now. And he meant this in a positive way. He said, Hillary shows up with this great lineage and this incredible Rolodex she's cultivated over the years. She has built a very, very strong base. She has indeed. You think you're her base? They're her base. She's delivered for them for over 40 years. She is a proven product. The reason they continue to pour money into her campaign, and now they've given over $110 million to this current campaign, is because they know that when they ask for something, they get it. That's how this system has worked. That's how it's worked for 40 years for the Clintons. So understand who they're working for. And 
It's not that they're particularly corrupt, it's that they're politicians. And they figured out how this system works, how you take advantage of it, and how you gain power within it. And you don't do it by appealing to a liberal base, a progressive base, workers, citizens. No, you do it by writing handwritten notes to people who do probably become your friends, the ones you listen to all the time, the ones whose perspective you care most about. These are not the people that Hillary Clinton is going to turn on and say, hey, you know what? It turns out the powerful in this country have created income inequality. They've rigged the rules. And that means your wages are down and they get all the tax breaks and they get all the Wall Street deregulation, a lot of which the Clintons did. You think she's going to turn all that around? And after winning all of this time with money in politics, she's going to say, oh, you know what? I don't want it anymore. Let's take money out of politics, even though it's given the Clinton family everything we ever wanted. You think that's the direction she's going to go in? <laughs> then maybe you are the sucker that she thinks you are. No. We know who her base is, and it ain't us, Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. All right, I like these different panels. Yes. We got Grace on today. All right. Yeah. Grace from Pop Trigger, Hannah, of course, from Think Tank. Uh, we had a great hour for you guys. Time to thank some members. Sarah Heath, member number 1059. Dion Green, uh, or Grine, uh, member number 1060. Dion, Sarah, you guys are awesome. Do another fun post game. You know, people love the post game from yesterday. Do they? Yeah, yes. I got a lot of tweets. I got going, some Damn. tweets too. Yeah, I yeah. feel like uh, most of them agreed with you, but well, a lot of them are guys. Yeah, so I mean. uh, me, Francis, and Hannah had mm -hmm. a discussion about: uh, Is it okay to lie women into sex? Okay, among other things. Right? <laughs> so Would you, I feel like you I'll be a medium that between there was both a debate worlds. about that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Okay, now we can maybe, talk about it. Yeah, maybe in today's post game we'll ask if it's okay for women to lie other women, women. into sex. Mm. We're so coy, you know. Mm. Mm. Okay, I uh, love that conversation. Okay, all those post games are for members. Tytnetwork.com/slash/join. Let me read a couple of quick tweets here for you guys, and then we'll get going with our leprechaun porn in this hour. <laughs> okay, uh, I love that story. David uh, says the TV media damn sure doesn't want Citizens United taken away from them. The corrupt election cash is spent on their advertising. So a very fair point. Uh, a lot of the ads uh, for politicians go into television and uh, and newspapers as well. Uh, Nick Negative says Jank Uger is on fire today. Thank you for being a beacon of light in the fog of corruption. Thank you, Nick. That's very, very nice of you. And it's not just me, though. It's I'm backed up by all you guys. That's the members that make the show happen. Um, and then no more donations writes in. Hillary and Bill Clinton make Claire and Frank Underwood look trustworthy by comparison. <laughs> Robert Dunning writes in. She got real on the Young Turks today. A little to my stomach. Uh, I assume he means a little sick to my stomach. And how deep the rabbit hole goes. Thanks. Yeah. Well, it is our job to, uh, to bring you the, the facts as best as we can. And finally, Ty Dai T says, so Obama puts up a corporate conservative judge and they still want to play political chicken. Wonderful. And that is the thing. I mean, what, <laughs> like the Democrats think they're so brilliant for putting up a conservative and aha, now how are you going to vote against them? What if the Republicans go, we're not going to vote against them. I call your bluff. Thank you for putting a conservative on the Supreme Court. Oops. <laughs> Okay, he is pro-choice. We think, we don't actually know, but I hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so wow, what a win for us. Okay, all right. Now, having said that, let's do it. What do you all got, right. Hannah? <clears throat> so, a Colorado man who filmed and posted a video of himself committing multiple traffic violations uh, to Facebook is now upset that police have issued him a ticket. Now, uh, Michael Dalton posted this video to his Facebook. He says he enjoys posting lots of videos to Facebook. And after uh, researching his Facebook briefly, I can confirm that. Now, he recorded a <laughs> short video uh, showing him cutting through the parking lot of the Trail Ridge apartment complex that sits in between his neighborhood and a shopping center. He uploaded the video to Facebook and shared it with a Woodland Park community page where it got a lot of attention. Now, we have some of this video for you guys. Take a look. Dalton recorded a short video showing him cutting through the parking lot of the Trail Ridge apartment complex near his house. He uploaded the video to a Woodland Park Facebook page where it got a lot of attention. People getting upset at me because it was showing through the parking lot, at private property, this, that, and the other. 
So now around a week after he posted this video to Facebook, he was visited by Woodland Park police officer at his house. He uh, recorded the video, presumably to post it on Facebook, uh, and he was issued a ticket for reckless driving and running a stop sign. Now, as you saw him in the video there, he's upset that he was issued this ticket. Uh, he says that if they can issue a ticket, can they do this to everybody? Well, yeah, essentially. Now, Sergeant Andy uh, LeBrand of the Woodland Park Police Department says, you have a First Amendment right to post whatever you want and can, but if you're breaking the law and it's in our jurisdiction, then we can do something about it. I just don't get why he's surprised. Like, mm. you did something illegal and then you put it on the internet for everybody to see. And he's like, oh, they, they're getting mad at me for doing something illegal. Yeah, like, the it, issue wasn't with the video. No one was saying you can't yeah. take videos. It wasn't a censorship thing. It was like, if you film yourself doing something illegal and do not think there will be consequences, well, welcome to the world, my friend. Like, it's not even welcome to America. It's like, what did you think was going to happen? Yeah. So it goes to the idea, though, guys, that people think that laws don't apply on the Internet. Mm -hmm. So I, if uh, I'm threatening you in real life, I know I can get in trouble for that, mm -hmm. right? But uh, on the Internet, I can threaten you all I want because there's yeah. no law on the Internet. No, no, there are laws. It's the same laws. It's just because you did it on the Internet doesn't mean that it's like a law-free zone, mm -hmm. and so in this case, like for example, you, you want to put up a video, as they said, of course you can, right? You want to do something on Facebook, of course you can. Right. But if you put up a video of you shooting someone in the head, yeah, they'll try you for murder because mm -hmm. you just gave them a video of you shooting someone in the head. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a more minor case, so I get why some people might be like, oh, do we want to waste the resources tracking this dude down for running a stop sign? It's like 18 days later or however many days. Partly I think that it got so much buzz in the town that the cops were like, oh yeah? Well, you're not going to embarrass us like that mm -hmm. by showing people like the shortcut through the highway yeah. and stuff. And by the, But on the other hand, I've been pulled over for going through a parking lot and not even running a stop sign, right? So I wasn't stupid enough to put it on video. I think he was shocked by it happening retroactively. So he mm. had he had yeah. done the violation, time had gone by, probably forgot about it, posted the video, and then he's visited by the cops. He's like, wait, wait, you didn't catch me doing it, so it doesn't count, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. we did now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and it's the same thing about, uh, I think it was back in December when the Ohio guy posted a video of himself drunk driving and then got arrested. I'm like, yeah, yes, post it's a, lot a like picture that. of yourself doing something illegal or doing something illegal like you mentioned. So if you give threats on the internet or something like that, or we recently covered something where they put, uh, they were threatening cops with emojis and they were investigating those threats. And I think for us, like some of these things, like running a stop sign in a parking lot or posting something, you know, with an emoji seems benign, but it is, you know, I think it, it calls to a bigger issue of posting things that are essentially illegal mm -hmm. uh, and, and something that we're having to face now in this age of the internet. Yeah, and I don't know about those neck of the woods, but he really didn't seem to give a damn about that stop sign. <laughs> yeah. He rolled through it so aggressively. Aggressively. Okay, and finally, uh, yes, there was one other case we covered, and there, and there are many of these. Somebody had robbed somebody and then came in and showing all the stuff that they had robbed, including some money <laughs> I on Facebook, that. right? And, and they're like, but that's not a violation of your privacy. You put up a picture of you robbing folks online, so that's evidence. So, of course, they're going to bust you if you put criminal actions online. So, just put a couple of thoughts behind it. Yeah. I love when criminals are dumb in the age of the internet. Mm. It just makes it easy. <laughs> True that. Yep. All right. <laughs> okay, before we move on, it yep. must be noted, I should have noted it from the beginning, uh, that uh, first of all, that it's St. Patrick's Day, and hence we're going to have the leprechaun porn later, and hence the green shirt. Uh, is that green? I, I was green. I was really hoping so. This is and this is believe it or not the fanciest green shirt that I own. <laughs> this Grace, is the fanciest you, green shirt I knowing own. Knowing you, uh, I'm going to say I believe it. Very believable. It was this or a basketball jersey. So I was like, I better go with the sleeves. <laughs> better go with sleeves. You have no green? <laughs> no, I totally forgot. I don't know if I have anything green. I don't really love. I was the color wondering green. about that. I was like, maybe a green tie or like a little mm. green pocket square or something. Mm. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I've never, in my entire life, I've never once worn a pocket square. Well, this could be the day. It yeah. could have been. And and how have we gone through St. Patrick's Day an hour and a half through the show, and I haven't said top of the morning to you yet? Must be. I was a little offended. <laughs> I have a Are you story. Irish? No, not at all. Not even remotely. I don't know. You're white, so it was possible. I could, and I'm so white, so it's very. It, I could be. It's a fair question. It's like she looks like she's never seen the sun before. Irish or vampire? We don't know. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. What's next, Hannah? What's next? All right. So it seems as though Adele's hello can solve almost anything from family feuds in a recent SNL skit to potentially a shorter sentence in court. Let's take a look at this video. Hello there. Yeah, I know I want to say I'm sorry for the things I've done. And I try and be stronger in this life I chose. But I want you to know that door I closed. In your honor, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. To my mother, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. To the victim, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Yes, Your Honor, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Oh. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, so that for is that, for that song. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, now that we before we go on and tell you what he did and all the details of the case, some things must be noted for the record. One, I like his Amish attorney. <laughs> do with a beard hanging yeah. out. Right? His other, the other attorney, a little like Noam Chomsky, but not a big deal. Okay, that's fine. But the the guy singing in court, and everybody's like, "Yeah, whatever." Okay. Well, that was anyway, gonna right? be like. Yeah, that's what I was going to say because even the article says like he's surprised a courtroom of onlookers. No, nobody looks surprised. Everybody's just like, "Yep." Like it was almost dude, like all a, just going around there. Like it was almost like a skit. I mean, isn't yeah. anybody going to go, "Dude, he's singing." Yeah. I was expecting at least one person to be like, "So this is this is what you're going to go with." Like or at least just, bring out just, like as your counsel for just a minute. Could bring I? out like a Snapchat or something to catch this on tape. I mean, seriously. And not even a clap at the end, to be no. honest. Like someone should have really just thrown him a bone and been like, Sure, man. You, all right. Yeah, you know, wrap it up. Yeah. Someone should have acknowledged it. The dude in the back with the crossing his arms is like picking lint on his things. <laughs> I couldn't care less. Chomsky's shuffling through papers. This might be the <laughs> coolest hearing ever. Maybe that's just kind of run of the mill where people just. You know, do whatever. Like, look at that guy just sorting through his papers. Like, no, this, everyone sings. Some people tap dance. <laughs> yeah. Everyone brings a talent. Yeah, I know, right? It's, I kind of want to hang out America's in the courtroom. America's got talent. That's what it is. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder if that, like, uh, earlier in this trial or something like that, he just like sings everything that he has to say, and then they're like, okay, dude, like, uh, uh, that's enough. We got it. We got the picture. No, no, like maybe everybody sings in that court. Yeah. So the lawyer gets up and goes, objection, objection, <laughs> objection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and by the way, when he first started singing, I was like, oh no, like I thought it was going to be like horrific. And then I was like, oh, actually, it's not that bad. Well, it's not <laughs> catchy, but it's not bad. I mean, yeah. he's got a lot of potential. They noted in the article, he seems like a very talented uh, young guy just trying to get his life back together. And yeah. of course, we applaud that. Um, but I think he could work on the hook a little bit more, just spitballing here. Uh, work on a little bit more verse, hook, get some beats in there. Just spitballing. Again, just throwing out some ideas. Maybe talk to your lawyer. I yeah, I said, I'm going to pull old Randy Jackson. A yeah. little, little pitchy dog. <laughs> Wait, what is the name of the band? To what a, to talk to ZZ Top, your lawyer. <laughs> All right, now tell us about the case, Hannah. All righty. Well, his name is Brian Earl Taylor, and he is 21, and he's saying his rendition of hello to uh, Judge Darlene O'Brien during his sentencing trial for unlawful imprisonment and carrying a concealed weapon. Now, Taylor was arrested after police found him struggling with another man and holding a gun to his abdomen on November 9th in 2015. Now, before delivering his song, uh, Taylor said he hopes to get a degree in business management in Eastern Michigan University, become involved in his church, and stay away from marijuana after his release. He also wants to be a role model for his younger brother and take care of his mother. And that uh, was the explanation before the song that he asked for reduced sentencing to achieve these goals. But despite his efforts, unfortunately, uh, through a sentencing agreement, Taylor was sentenced two years in prison for illegally carrying a concealed weapon and 18 months to 15 years for unlawful imprisonment. Five other charges against him in the case were dismissed. So that's a, a silver lining. And he's scheduled for a final pretrial uh, later this month. So I very briefly worked as a prosecutor, yeah. like a summer intern when I was going to law school a couple of times. And so maybe that's old school jank. Like I'm not impressed by the singing. Like I, like I said, it's not a bad job of singing, but I don't really care. One of the things he did was, according to the charges, and he's found guilty, is that he stuck a gun on a guy's uh, and and got him to go in his car. They drove mm -hmm. the car, then they robbed him. Imagine how scared that guy is. 
So I'm not like the whole sorry, sorry. Like yeah, I would have preferred the sorry before you stuck the gun in my face, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So um, you know, I, I just didn't. The singing for me didn't give me any indication or his pleas about how he's going to get the business degree and stuff. Right now, you might find this ironic because we're for, for criminal justice reform, but that's not ironic. Criminal justice reform for people who are using drugs. We've mm-hmm. packed the the prisons with millions of people. Who it's like? For, oh my God! He drank a bud. Let's put him in jail. That's crazy. You put a gun into somebody and rob him. It's not crazy to put you in jail. That's what jails are for. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. And she said uh, the judge said he's obviously a talented young man, but I think her sentencing kind of uh, illustrated your same feeling. She's like he's talented, but no, he's still going to go to jail. Like thank you, thank you for your song, but no, like you, this is still what you. You, you could also. You know, postulate how serious did he take this hearing if he's singing? You know, I mean, he obviously does sound very remorseful, and who am I to kind of speculate if he does feel remorse? That's not my place. But it's a really serious, you know, thing that's happening. And yeah. singing, I think, kind of it it does. It, that's why we like music. It like alleviates stress. It you know, kind mm-hmm. of lightens the mood a little bit. It, it did seem a little bit inappropriate, I will say. So I understand why the judge also um, made her final judgment. Yeah, and I, look, I think that. Uh, Inappropriate things in other circumstances, I kind of like. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of fun. And if you're singing in it, like at a restaurant, okay, just don't sing to me. That's awkward. Okay, <laughs> but like if you're singing to somebody else, I'm having fun. Yeah. But if I'm the guy who got the gun pointed at him, I, I'm not really finding it cute. And yeah. if I'm the judge, it's not really music to my ears. Oh, oh no. <laughs> 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 I had to end on a corny joke. I had to do it. You have I'm to. sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, we move forward. All right. So, a high school teacher and church leader uh, has been arrested after confessing to hosting sex parties for teenage boys. Now, Jared Anderson has been charged with sexual assault of a child, sexual performance of a child, uh, possession of child pornography, and indecency of a child during what he called Bros Night. Now, on February 12th, Anderson had held a Bros Night at his home that was attended by seven boys between the ages of 15 and 17. A sign at the door read, "The last." one to get naked has the first dare. Now, according to police, the boys stripped naked and were instructed to play games with each other while Anderson walked around naked with an erection. The teens were allegedly instructed to crawl around naked and touch each other and to place their genitals on another boy's face. Uh, Anderson's mouth also came in contact with a boy's genital. Anderson also allegedly challenged a uh, 17-year-old to see who could be the most obscene. It involved him and the teen sending pictures of their genitals to each other. Uh, Now, Child Protective Services was notified after the alleged incident was reported to a church last week where Anderson was a group leader. Of course Uh, he he was. Right. He has since been uh, banned from returning to that church, and he's also been put on administrative leave pending the results of the police investigation. Uh, So he did confess to doing this. So I feel like the whole he has been put on administrative leave pending the results. I mean, he's already confessed to doing it. So yeah, maybe uh, just <laughs> yeah. Like that's pro- that's probably enough of that. Uh, I I don't know. Is this normal in high schools? Like if I, if I went to a, first of all, the idea of going to a sex party led by a, one of my male teachers would have been a little bit of a cautionary note for me. Mm-hmm. And then when I got to the to the door and it said, hey, let's all take off our clothes, that would have been red flag number two. His erection would have been red flag number three. Yeah. Right? Like what is this a thing that happens? Well and, and the, the yeah, I feel like we're victim blaming a little bit, all right? So he's a teacher, he's in a position of power, and these are right. underage uh, students, right? And so I feel like you never know what other sort of power dynamics that he was playing with them at school, what relationships he developed with them beforehand to make him feel like uh, they trusted him or something like that, or they could trust him, and sort of slowly ease into this this relationship that t- did take place into getting these boys to his home to get involved in these sort of lewd activities. I don't want to say like, oh, you should have seen the red flags, because that's not really fair to these underage kids. Well, okay, you're of course right, and I'm not proposing we do anything to the kids. They're the ones who are traumatized by this, etc. Right. Obviously, and I'm proposing we give him a stiff sentence, if you will. Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, now, um, but on the other hand, like I, I'm not trying to blame him, but I'm like, like I'm picturing one of my male teachers inviting me to a party where he's naked and has an erection, and I'm trying to picture. Under what circumstances 
I wouldn't have been like calling 911. Yeah, right? I think also specifically titling it a bros night, isn't that just another way to say sausage fest, which is pretty much what guys tend to avoid? You know, like but that's bros I- night, like let's no, like hey, do we want to only hang out with a bunch of dudes and not See any well, girls? Also, we don't know. We don't know the sexual orientation of any of these boys, and I it's think true. that's not really part of part of the discussion. What happened here is somebody in a power position, uh, who is a high school teacher, who's t- way older, mm-hmm. uh, and also a church group leader, took advantage of uh, you know seven boys, and all seven boys uh, did give the police a statement, and and that's how they eventually found out was when one of them reported to the church what was going on. So obviously, they were under you know some sort of uh, a uh, duress or something that that led them to this. I'm not saying that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. No, and I, this bros thing. I didn't know the bro thing was a uh, code for gay. I had no idea. Like, was it? Was I don't it, think well, it like, is. You know, because, I think he called it as like we're all gonna hang out, like just us guys, no girls. Don't tell your parents. Like it, it was. You know what I mean? Like I think the it's very predatory behavior, yes. and it just shows how you know devious this guy was. That he was like, I'm gonna create this entire mm-hmm. night for these boys, and then I'm gonna prey on them right. and then I'm sure that there was some grooming that went on earlier so mm-hmm. that they you know right. walked into it otherwise you're right a lot of high school boys would be like uh what the fuck dude like I don't want to go to your bros night you're making it weird dude you know and like right. that they would have called they would have you know because seen the red flag but it seems like he really groomed them so that they they did walk into bros night which is so stupid there, what a dumb name there's a new app out that's like for bros but it turns out it's like if you want to hang out go to a movie or uh, have sex with one another, and I'm like, really? Yeah, and I'm like, that's no, it's. I didn't realize having sex with one another was a bro thing, right? Like that yeah. puts a whole new spin on the whole bros before da da da, right? Yeah. And so like, and now this guy's is like, oh, sex party. You show up, there are no girls, and he's walking around with an erection, right? So like, is this a like? I'm thinking like, there's two stories now with bros being like, oh, bros hang out and have sex with one another. Like I didn't know. I just didn't know it. I didn't know that that was a bro thing. I, I don't think it's a ubiquitous term. I think, like Grace said, it was sort of like, "Hey, we're having a guys night, right?" And uh-huh. so I think the bro app uh, that you're that you're uh, alluding to is this sort of trying to get on that you know that spectrum, that territory where you're not totally straight and you're not totally gay, and they're just trying to have a, a term that everybody's comfortable with, mm-hmm. like like guys. It could have been called guys. I don't think it has some sort of gay undertone like you're you're insinuating. Okay, apparently it does for some people, but yes, it's probably an exception. Anyways, uh, I don't want anybody to get me wrong. Uh, not only am I not a victim, they turned him in. That's why he's right. Uh, right that's why he was caught. Uh, it's just amazing. That he thought he can get away with it, like right? No, you know. it's sick. It's completely sick that he took advantage of these boys in this situation. Uh, the entire story—it just sounds. It just gives me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm glad he was caught. I'm glad he confessed to it, so that he can, uh, you know, really deal with the, the effects of the law here. And, and so I'll needlessly add one last thing, which is that it's amazing the different contexts that we grew up in, because uh, Jimmy um, uh, grew up. Uh, and went to, I think, a Catholic church, and he says some of the Monsignors would touch the boys, and they would do things like this. They'd invite right. them over, and, and and then eventually one of them got caught and then got moved, like like in the old days, mm-hmm. right, et cetera. In our uh, high school, again, this blows my mind. Like, I couldn't, like, it's impossible to think of one of my teachers inviting a seven guys over and walking around naked. Like, mm-hmm. we would have been like, what the fuck is this, yeah. right? But I think... Uh, you're right, Grace, that he must have groomed them in some way, right? Mm-hmm. So that when they got there, that they weren't, they didn't immediately leave. Like he must have worked on this for a long time Which is to get it to this so point. Which is, yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is what happens in a lot of these situations and why it's so horrendous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll lighten it up. Uh, uh, what do guys do online during St. Patrick's Day? You kind of don't want to know, but secretly you kind of do want to know. That's why you're going to come back.